Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're just waiting a, a few seconds just to finish letting people into the Zoom webinar. Um, thanks for coming, those of you who are already with us. We're also streaming live. Uh, and I can see the numbers shooting up. So I think it's time to begin. To introduce myself, I'm Patrick Foley. I'm from Arise Festival, and I'm very pleased to be chairing tonight's meeting, bringing voices from across our movement together to look at the deepening cost of living crisis emergency uh, just two days before Sunak and Jeremy Hunt's budget. Tonight, we're going to be asking the question, what would a people's budget look like? And we're going to be calling for investment, not yet more cuts ahead of the budget on Wednesday. I'm pleased to say that over 500 people have registered in advance of the event and thousands more will be joining us uh, across our streams on social media, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, here on the Zoom webinar. The cost of living crisis is deepening by the day, but the Tories are more interested in corporate profits than our health, jobs and livelihoods. We need to look at the extent of the crisis, what can be done to resist it, and what the economic alternative is that puts people first based on investment, not cuts. And as all of you know, we're at a crossroads. The Tories are overseeing this disastrous fall in people's living standards. And at the same time, it's clear the Tories are the same old nasty party, scapegoat scapegoating refugees and playing divide and rule tactics. They need to go and there is hope in the growing movement against them as the continuing strike action this Wednesday which we'll be hearing more about from the PCS today, shows. We must build this massive movement and win the argument for urgent action to tackle the crisis. There is an alternative that puts people before corporate greed, and, and today we're going to outline what a socialist economic strategy would look like. And as this session goes on, please remember to post your questions in the comments in the uh, questions and comments in the Q&A function on Zoom and on in the comments uh, sections on YouTube, Facebook and uh, feel free to tweet at us as well at Arise Festival. Uh, we're gonna put as many questions as we can to our panel. So please also tell us where you're tuning in from, tell us your own stories, whether you're gonna be joining the strikes on Wednesday, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I'd like to also just take a minute to say, these events cost money. Uh, we've, been, we've been proud to bring a lot of movement-based um, events to, to, to our movement for the last few years, but they do cost money. And so we'll be asking today if, if any of you can become a friend of Arise Festival, just so we can keep holding events and discussions like this, both online and in person, uh, to continue our struggle and to continue putting forward socialist solutions to the crisis. I'm now going to introduce our speakers for tonight's uh, session. Um, they each have seven minutes, and then we're going to go and move to questions. So first up uh, is a great friend of, of both Arise and the Labour Assembly Against Austerity. And that is John Trickett, MP. Uh, so it's my pleasure to have John introduce the event and give us a, a rundown uh, of what we're facing and what we're up against today. So thank you, John. Well, thanks very much. Congratulations to you, Patrick, to Matt and every, all the team. If you can help to finance it, please do so. And uh, welcome to all of you who have joined us to uh, engage in this debate. Well, look, we're in budget week, as we've just heard. I'm going to try to provide a large framing argument, and some of the other speakers will speak in more detail, perhaps, about the budget. But in the run-up to the budget, and in any event during the year, there's been a huge amount of talk about the current economic situation. Of course, the right-wing media, the Tories and various other people want to suggest that somehow the critical economic situation that we're in was created by the war in Ukraine and uh, the COVID pandemic. And of course, those two processes did contribute to recent turmoil in the markets and in the economy. But here's the point we need to stick to. Neither the war nor COVID transformed the way in which our economic system worked in its fundamentals. The contours of our economic system, contours, I should say, remained the same as they were before these crises. And our reaction ought to be, our analysis ought to be, as it was before the two crises also, so let's recall first that the before COVID, before the war, the banking collapse, 2008, um, the wealth uh, up to the arrival of pandemic. So from the crash to the pandemic, the wealth of the richest thousand people increased by 538 billion pounds, in spite of the fact that we're in an austerity uh, Tory government and before that the coalition. So 538 billion pounds for the richest thousand people 
the stock exchange increased by a value of two trillion pounds. Meanwhile, wages and salaries for working people fell by just under 450 billion pounds. So here we have, joining us, I suppose, a crisis created by the banks, financial capitalism and austerity, which we're all in it together argument. What we actually had was a direct and huge transfer of income and wealth away from working people and to the richest and to the large corporations. Whilst that wealth was growing, as I've just described, millions of our fellow citizens fell into poverty and some into really difficult situations. And at the same time, our public services were cut to the bone. But it wasn't just an accident that happened during the austerity years. It's how our system works. We need to understand that, agree it, and make the case. The truth is that the wealth of our country is more or less continually increasing because working people produce more goods and service per, services per hour, more wealth. But then what happens to that additional wealth? Well, we know it goes into the pockets of the richest and the big corporations. Has any of that really changed since COVID and the war? Well, the answer to that question is no. We know that working people, pensioners, people on benefits are increasingly struggled to survive as the prices shoot up. Only you have to go to the supermarkets just for five minutes once a week to see what's happening. Prices of so many goods no longer attainable for ordinary folk. And the cause of the rising prices, let's be blunt about this, is twofold. It's corporate profiteering and the power of the monopolies and cartels in so many key sectors of the British economy, which effectively allows them to pump up prices while wages and salaries are being held down. The leader of the United Union today in the, um, in the paper pointed out that the profits of the FTSE 350 almost doubled, almost doubled in a six month period, 2022, during the COVID crisis, Tesco, Sainsbury's and Asda doubled their combined profits between 2019 and 2021. So what we have, un unattainable price rises for the many imposed by the power of the corporations on the one hand, and on the other, uh, unattainable price on the one hand, sorry profits for a few on the other. In my constituency, many, I find many people now are actually literally cutting off their own energy supply because they can't afford to pay the bills. They don't want to pay the standing charges. A one man in my constituency I became aware of bought a lot of those little barbecue sets that you get in supermarkets in the summer. He bought them at the end of the summer for a knockdown price. What's he doing? He's now engaged in the horrifyingly dangerous practice of lighting those barbecue sets one at a time indoors, so it's very dangerous, in order to try to keep warm in the middle of winter. A local mother, she went to the local clothes bank in our area. Five children couldn't afford to put shoes on their feet, on jackets on their back without the assistance of local people. But you can bet your life one thing that neither Sunak nor Hunt in whose hands our economy lies this week, have never been in the situation which faces millions of people today. We know that for a fact, don't we? They're both millionaires. The PM, his greatest single personal concern, concern this week, where we learned, was to not to decide how to clothe his children, but how to change the local electricity grid in order to heat his swimming pool. Meanwhile, the Chancellor sold his company in 2017 for 14 million. Pounds. This is a country uh, run by the rich for the rich, but it's time to fight back. And we see, obviously, we see a glimmer of hope in the current wave of collective action. Tens of thousands of workers now deciding it's time to fight back. And in many cases, the strikes are winning major victories. Collective action does work. Look at an airport, 28% pay rise. Croydon Hospital, porters and domestics, 24% pay rise. Liverpool Dockers, 18.5%, the five firefighters in the FBU, 12%. All of these rises of price wage rises have been achieved because people are in a union and they will fight for what they believe in. We should all be in a union, every one of us, all our families, friends, and neighbors. Let's support the unions when they recommend action. 
it's our task as socialists also to act in solidarity with those, with others uh, in other industries apart from ours when they take action. When it's our turn, we'll get their support. And when it's their turn, we owe them our support. Now, visiting the picket lines, as many of you will have done, is very enlightening because often the press want to pretend that the public don't support the strikers. Let me tell you, as all of you will know, that is simply untrue. The support of the wide, wider public passing by is often overwhelming. However, this is my worry. The fear that must be that the wealthy will find a way around the current trade union victories. And let's call them what they are. They are working class victories. The rich will simply safeguard their profits by increasing prices. So in the end, though we do believe in the struggle and we should engage in it, in the end, we need a political solution. It's impossible to imagine that the current problems facing so many working people, the country as a whole, can be resolved purely by ameliorative steps, like giving aspirin to a cancer sufferer. Let me give you one example. The upcoming budget is being trumpeted as providing back to work incentives. They want us to focus on welfare benefits, but the problems are profound. Greedy employers, zero hours, agency labor, underemployment, false, false self-employment, and many other malpractices. So if we're gonna tackle the underlying problems of the labor market, the answer can only be in the end to secure a, an enduring and permanent shift in the balance of wealth and power, to use a famous phrase, in favor of working people, because the issues which we're talking about tonight, they are systemic in character. It's part of the system. You can see that the owners of big wealth know how to protect themselves in the face of major challenges like the banking crisis, COVID and so on. And if that's the case, then whilst fighting every inch of the way for more uh, wages and salaries, for more better funded schools and hospitals, we must offer system change that has to be our central message. It's the only way out of the present chronic crisis into which neoliberal economics has driven the country. I hope we have a good discussion tonight and that we can get out and fight both for in the here and now for rises, but then for a different kind of society, a different kind of economy. And I'm sure that most of you hopefully would agree with that and join us in the fight. And thanks very much for inviting me. Thank you so much for that, John. Uh, some really actually heartbreaking stories and examples from you there. Um, and I think they'll probably resonate with a lot of people around the country for, because just people up and down the country are just struggling so, so much at the moment. And uh, this isn't an accident. As John said, this is a result of corporate profiteering. I, I liked the really simple example that this is a direct transfer of income and wealth from the workers to the richest. Uh, and we're seeing that. We're seeing that every day. Um, we know all these systemic issues are interlinked and, and that's why the government attacks migrants, attacks trade unionists, and it's trying to shut down our right to resist because we have the answers to the, to the crisis that they don't have. And they simply, they're simply at a loss and, and are lashing out now against our movement. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes now just to bring in Matt Wilbris, who's also from Arise. Uh, and he's just gonna speak to us a little bit more about how you can support Arise in the, in the struggle in the coming months. Thanks, Patrick, and thank you, John, for that brilliant opening contribution and all the help and support you've given us over recent years. It's so very much appreciated by myself and all the other volunteers. Um, I'm here, as Patrick says, to do the plug, but I'm hoping it's a bit of a plug with a difference, and that's a plug with some politics in it. Um, so fight the massive Tory offensive against our jobs, livelihoods and rights that John and others have outlined. We need to link together resistance movements with trade unions, left publications, left politicians, and activists. And as John and Patrick have both said, Arise does that vital work. Tens of thousands have taken part in our online events just this year alone, and we need, but we do need to be doing more. If just a fraction of that number gave a regular gift, it could help us become the powerful platform, socialist solution to the crisis we desperately need here in Britain. That's why, as Patrick mentioned, we've launched Friends of Arise. It's rather lovely. It, we have a nice picture of Richard Bergen on it. It's a rather lovely leaflet. That's why we've launched Friends of Arise to help take our work to the next level. We're looking for 50 supporters initially to give at least five pound a month for the link that you'll see now in the chat and become a friend of Arise. There are three reasons primarily why we're doing this. One is to expand our return to in-person events, take them across different regions and nations. Two is to take new initiatives, including our regular podcast, which you may have seen 
started to appearing and more video content outside of the event. And three is to continue to host these large online meetings and make sure they have the greatest possible impact and reach. Um, and just to say that the platform we have now, because it's so big online, does cost over £500 a month just for online, different tools, lists, web, hosting, Zoom, Restream, you name it, it does add up more than you might think. And because we're using big numbers now, it's over £500 a month, that in itself is a big cost. If you do become a friend of Arise, you will receive some badges and other merchandise, be entered into an annual prize draw, and most importantly, know you are playing a key role in sustaining and expanding our vital work. So please do visit that link in the chat. Um, as Richard Bergen has said in launching this initiative, Arise has stood shoulder to shoulder with workers taking strike action, hosted key debates on the economic alternatives we need and linked up with progressive struggles the world over. Give them your support to help Arise keep growing from strength to strength. Thanks uh, for having me, and I hope you're all able to join us at our next event, which is again with John Trickett. It's the first of our Engels lectures and has already had an incredible amount of interest. And please do become a friend of Arise. Thank you, Patrick. Great stuff. Cheers, Matt. Yeah, so just to echo that, honestly, if you, if you can, please do uh, check out Friend of Arise. I think the links will be posted in the chat as we speak. Um, we need as many supporters as possible. It really, really helps us build our platform. And, and like Matt said, we're reaching hundreds of thousands of people over the last few years. And it's, it's incredible to be in a position where we can speak to that many people directly. And we want to do more. Simple as that. Um, I'm going to move quickly on because we've got quite a few speakers, but I'm going to move quickly on to our next speaker, who's a fantastic fighting trade unionist, who many of you will know. And that is Sarah Woolley, who's the BFAW General Secretary. So, Sarah, uh, if you're with us, over to you. Thanks, Patrick, and thanks to Arise for the invitation to speak um, tonight. And I, I wanted to start off by sending mine and the BFAW's absolute solidarity to the BMA and the HCSA junior doctors who are out on strike today in the next few days, the GMB members at Amazon in Coventry and Mersey Care NHS Foundation Trust, the Unite members in Diageo, and to the PCS members, the NEU members and RMT members that have strike action coming up this week. The rallies on Wednesday, I'm sure, are going to be absolutely epic. And to every worker out there who is stepping up collectively to demand change, our solidarity is with you. You are amazing and inspiring so many others to step up too. To every activist who is working hard to challenge discrimination against disabled people, migrants and refugees, and the many other campaigns that are ongoing locally and nationally, we stand in solidarity with you as well. And to those who may be watching who aren't in a trade union, but want to organise in your workplace initially, um, but hopefully as we grow communities too, come together with co-workers to challenge bad practices or just push for a decent pay rise. Get in touch with Organise now. We have over 150 volunteers who are ready to help coach you through making a difference in your workplace. And it starts with talking to those around you. The Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union represents people throughout the food industry. Our members keep the nation fed and are part of the biggest manufacturing unit in the UK. Yet when it comes to government investment, our industry is at the bottom of the pile left behind by the government in favour of other industries, which means companies are left to use profits, if indeed they make them, to pay for new initiatives such as being greener, to repair machinery or purchase new pieces of kit, to keep up with competitors and the pressure from supermarkets and consumers to pr produce more products for less money. This means that the pot then available for workers' terms and conditions is squeezed and squeezed because the cart continue to push high price increases onto consumers the struggling as it is, and they will go elsewhere, which will have a negative impact overall. And, and you know, shareholders aren't going to want to lose out on their profits now, are they? Meaning that our members' wages, terms and conditions are pushed further and further down. Paid breaks being taken away, overtime reduced, differentials between grades eroded, and the minimum wage becoming more of a reality for many of them, who for years have worked for employers who championed the fact they were anything but a minimum wage employer. And then add to that the cuts others are going to cover tonight to our NHS, benefits, public services, education and local councils. And those mentioned in the, the Q&A, such as bus accessibility and other public transports. We are seeing more of our members turn to places like the Ron Todd Foundation for solidarity packages and support. And, and food banks are becoming a regular occurrence for those who weren't surviving back in 2021 before the cost of living crisis started, never mind now. 
Our industry needs investment from the government to ensure that every worker is well paid, at least £15 an hour, as access to full sick pay from day one. We know that small and medium businesses may struggle to keep up with the huge national and international organisations operating within the food industry in terms of tech and speed. But investment from the government, even if it was only to ensure our industry was greener, would certainly help them to be able to pay our members better and attract people into an industry that has long been seen as somewhere to go when there's nowhere else. We know those from outside of our movement are going to ask, well, where's all this money going to come from for all this investment that's needed from across multiple sectors? Because that's what they do. They forget that millions of pounds can be found when it's needed for a failed track and trace system through COVID. But heaven forbid we want workers to be paid decent wages or a reduction in utility bills that are literally crippling families or an increase to benefits that literally could mean that people that can't work have got that support and are able to put the heating on through winter. Well, a start would be getting the likes of Amazon and Starbucks to pay the taxes, wouldn't it? Getting people like Alistair Salverson or organisations like Elagmar, this private equity firm that we've had dealings with in the last 12 months, to pay out the redundancy payments that were negotiated in good faith with the BFAWU out of the tens of millions of pounds they boast um, of having in the bank, rather than passing the burden over to the taxpayer as they both chose to go into administration instead of doing the right thing. We need to educate people about the importance and the relevance of trade unions and keep pushing back that people like me, general secretaries at the trade union, our members are, and they decide the direction and they decide the action that they are going to take because they know they are worth more than they're being offered. If you're, wanting, if you're watching and you want to organise your workplace but don't know where to start, do get in contact with Organise Now where our group of coaches can support you through. If you're watching this and not in a trade union, join one and get active within it. Also look out for organisations like the Ron Todd Foundation or Deepak, the Disabled People Against Cuts, who do amazing work in our communities because organising is needed there too. We know whatever comes out on Wednesday with the Chancellor's announcement is going to focus on making sure the Tories', Tories friends and their donors are going to get richer whilst making life more difficult for the rest of us because that is the Tories through and through. They are no friends of the working class. And the only way that we can enact change is by working together in solidarity across the labour, the trade union and community movements. No one is going to give us anything for free, but together we are a force to be reckoned with. Join a picket line this week, join a trade union and organise now. Solidarity. Thank you for that, Sarah. I, I just just on the, to on the topic of the, the budget, you know, it's, it's such a fundamental part of, of any people's budget would be transforming um, our economy to, to bring more power back to working people and also to making sure that all those pe people that Sarah mentioned are supported because more money in the pockets of people, everyday people, um, it makes our economy stronger. It doesn't get stronger when it's sat in the banks of the super rich. You know, that's something we really need to keep pushing. Um, so a fantastic contribution from Sarah there. Uh, I'm going to move quickly on to our next speaker, who's Donna Guthrie. Uh, and Donna's the, the Women's Officer of um, Barack UK, which is Black Activists Rising Against the Cuts. Uh, so over to you, Donna. Thank you. Thanks very much. I hope everyone can hear me. And um, thank you very much for inviting Barak to come and speak at this really good and important meeting about an alternative budget and what we need. We faced over 10 years of austerity with cuts to jobs, welfare, public services and three years of pandemic that has impacted the most on black communities, women, the elderly, disabled and young people. These disproportionate impacts have amplified racism with black people facing increased inequality in housing, employment, health, income and also targeted viciously with racist immigration controls under the government's hostile environment. Black women, like myself, have been impacted more so, often concentrated in low paid, part time and temporary work, hardest hit by austerity, and now with a cost of living crisis unable to afford huge price rises. Black women are at least three times more likely to be unemployed compared to their white counterparts. And as we've seen, the last 13 years of cuts have impacted on women's services, such as women's centres and refuges. Women's earnings have been ha hammered and black women have faced increased 
social and economic hardship due to systemic racism. The COVID pandemic exposed the racial inequalities in society. Black workers were exposed to COVID and died at higher death rates. More were frontline workers lacking adequate PPE. We had a lack of financial support to self-isolate for many with no occupational health sick entitlement for some. Um, and people were on no curriculums to public fund if they had to stop work. Many living in the worst housing conditions and with higher levels of overcrowding in their housing conditions. Huge cuts we've seen over the last 10, 13 years um, of local government funding from central government have seen lots of deprived boroughs, such as the borough that I live in, Newham in East London, with huge, huge cuts in their services and in job cuts. Um, last year, Newham refuge workers, some of the lowest paid in my union, Unite, had to take sustained strike action to win a decent pay rise in the face of this cost of living crisis. We support the calls for a people's budget and the demands outlined in the Labour Assembly Against Austerity petition to Richie Sunak. We do need an end to zero hour contracts and precarious work conditions that many black workers disproportionately find themselves in. We need a real living wage. We need a rise in the national minimum wage to £15 an hour, an increase in statutory sick pay, employment rights from day one. Workers should not have to pay for the cost of living crisis. And these gains would have a positive impact on black communities and black workers. Like many have talked about and we'll talk about tonight, fat cat employers should not be let off the hook and governments should not be funding the bankers and their friends and the super rich. They should be funding our public services and ensuring that essential workers, the key workers that kept this economy running during the pandemic, are paid a fair pay rise that they have demanded. My, do my daughter works in a school and she can't afford private housing. She can't afford to buy a home. Her income simply isn't enough. Housing is broken. We need real social housing. My son-in-law, a teacher, was on strike, out on strike on the 1st of February with his NEU colleagues. They deserve a decent pay rise, not a pay cut. On that day, on the 1st of February, I marched alongside tens of thousands of strikers in central London. I met many, many black workers, young workers, women workers, striking for the first time realizing that the strength and power that they hold if they organize and, and take action together to win. As well as being a national women's officer for Barrack UK and a lifelong trade unionist and anti-racist campaigner, I'm a proud union activist still now. And as a black worker myself, impacted by the cost of living crisis, I led the pay campaign last year in my workplace to ensure that we protected workers, particularly low paid workers. We successfully won a pay rise which targeted the lowest paid staff, those impacted by austerity, systemic racism, our black staff on low grades, our staff that were forced to move back, home, move back home to their parents' homes because they couldn't afford their private rent, staff forced to take out monthly loans to survive. We made sure that as our General Secretary, United General Secretary, Sharon Graham says, if the money's there, the workers shouldn't have to pay for this crisis. I'm proud of what I and my members won. Barrack UK sends, and myself send, solidarity to all the trade union members that will be out on strike this Wednesday, Budget Day. Around 600,000 workers up and down the country will be on strike, taken to the streets to demand an alternative budget. Teachers in NEU, junior doctors in BMA and HCSA, London Underground drivers, represented by ASLEF Union, civil servants in P PCS union, public sector workers in Prospect, dental trainees in BDA, NUJ members in the BBC local, and university staff that I work alongside and organise in UCU, University College Union. I want to do a quick plug. We've got a petition which I'll circulate to the organisers to put in the chat, a petition to stop the BBC from axing black and Asian radio shows that we set up in December this year that's still running because we need to make sure the cuts, systemic cuts that are affecting workers are um, challenged everywhere. Systemic racism is such that black and brown workers here, sometimes, you know, that, that we get clapped for keeping the economy going during the pandemic in the NHS, care workers, 
shop workers, transport workers, security workers. But actually, as well as being clapped and holding the economy together, some black workers face the hostile environment of immigration controls, so much so that they're the victims of Windrush scandals and mismanaged compensation schemes and continued attacks on our um, our position in, and um, get into this to the UK. Some black and brown people face such dangers that they don't even have a chance to think about economics or budgets. Tonight, I want to end before I, I, I end in giving solidarity to the protest in Parliament Square against the anti-refugee bill, an evil bill that will see the pushback of small boats in the channel, sentencing to death people seeking protection and fleeing danger. An evil bill that will tear up protection for refugees, punishing people for seeking safety um, and stopping people who actually get here from being able to rebuild their lives. Let's be clear, this is an abuse of human rights and it's essential that we challenge it collectively. So solidarity to everyone taking a stand. Nobody embarks on a perilous journey unless they believe that what they are fleeing is worse than what they face. And people need to remember that 75% of those crossing the channel on those small boats are children. We must shout loud and clear, refugees are welcome here. We've been here before and we must unite and defeat this bill. Back in the autumn of 2021, when the government instructed border force agencies to start turning away small boats of migrants, Barrack UK launched a hard hitting petition on Action Storm, which again is still live. So I do what I do, I'll send that to the organisers to put the link on that as well, if I can, to share that with you. Or you can check out Barrack's website. And we need to spread the word. That campaign in 2021, um, Barrack joined along with other civil society groups across the UK, and we formed Citizens is a Right Coalition. And protests and marches took place to defend asylum seekers and refugees. The sustained public pressure led to a U-turn of the government. Um, there was a defeat in the, in the House of Lords of the bill and the government made a U-turn. But the battle was won, but the fight is not over. As we've seen today, with the government coming back with this evil bill, we must stand together with decent society and with Gary Lineker. Pushback is a death sentence. This turnaround policy was in breach of UN humanitarian aid, um, law and contradicts UK's own laws on supporting asylum. The majority of people in the UK surveyed, 82% want to help refugees, but this government wants to distract us from their corruption and their failures. It's a classic divide and rule. We must all oppose racism, oppose racism wherever it is. Three years on, from the global Black Lives Matter protests sparked by the police murder of George Floyd, racial inequality has continued and the need for change is as pressing now as it was back then in 2020. We must defeat this bill, Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you for that, Donna. And, and I'm sure everyone who's involved in a meeting today shares your sentiment and shares your message of solidarity to, to the protest outside Parliament. I imagine still going on right now. Uh, for those who don't know, the anti-migrant bill was being debated in Parliament today. Um, and on that note, I actually have a message from one of our speakers who sadly won't be able to join us this evening because she is trying to get um, a word in in that debate and speak up for the rights of, of migrant uh, migrants and speak out against this this uh, disastrous legis legislation. And that is from Rebecca Long Bailey MP. Um, so I'm just going to read out a short message from Rebecca now. Uh, I'm so sorry I can't be there with you today. I'm here speaking. I'm here sitting, waiting to try and speak in the debate on the illegal immigration bill. It is immoral, in, inhumane and unworkable. It does not reflect the compassionate, decent country I know we all live in. What is worse, the government is deliberately stoking dangerous and worrying division at a time when people face profound economic hardship. In the last 13 years, we have suffered deliberate austerity, bandit capitalism, Tory cronyism, all, all while wages have fallen, jobs have become more casual, public services are at the point of collapse, and we face the worst cost of living crisis in decades. It's on all of us in the movement to make it clear who is really responsible. 
It wasn't refugees who sold off who sold off council houses and refused to build new ones. It wasn't refugees that started up, that starved our NHS and public services of funding. And it wasn't refugees who cut taxes for the wealthy while the rest of the country struggled to heat their homes and feed their families. That was the government. They have got to go. Solidarity. So big thanks to Becky uh, for that message. I, I'm, I'm sorry to everyone who's looking forward to her, but she's clearly got a, a very important fight on her hands in, in Parliament tonight. Uh, I'd just also just like to take a minute to say there's over 400 people joining us on the streams and on the Zoom webinar tonight. And people are signing in from Edinburgh, Dorset, Colwyn, uh, Colwyn Bay, that is Islington, P Paisley, Manchester, North West Durham, Shrewsbury, Dulwich, Somerset, Stroud, Haringey, Newcastle, Somerset and more. Um, so thank you all for coming. And it's, it's, it's amazing to just see people coming from all over the country and so many of you joining us tonight. Uh, before our next speaker, I just want to just remind you that you can post your questions in the chat. So please keep them coming if you, if you haven't already. Uh, send us your messages, messages of solidarity, all of that. Post that in the Q&A. If you're on YouTube, post that in the comments. And also to, to make sure to look at all the action points that are being posted in the chat as well. And we're going to try and get Donna's two petitions that she mentioned in there for you all as well. Uh, so I'm going to move on to our next speaker now. Our next speaker is Oslem Onoran, who's the Professor of Economics at uh, Greenwich University. And Oslem's in a very good position to give us an expert take on why Tory economics are failing and what a left uh, alternative is. So, Donna, uh, so uh, Oslem, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thanks for having me. It's another Arise event. It's a very exciting uh, turning point for us in the public sector uh, just before our all out in the public sector strike uh, rally on the 15th of March. Um, I wanted to share my slides with you um, because I want to show you the story of the public sector strikes on Wednesday. Uh, but before I do that, uh, this new uh, budget has been dubbed as back to work budget. But in reality, what it is, is a class warfare budget. And hopefully we will uh, be able to speak uh, a little bit more in detail what a people's budget can look like, uh, very much in line with the petition that we have been all uh, signing that has been circulated in the chat and endorsed my by my colleagues who spoke before me. So what is so misleading about the talk about the government not being able to increase public sector pay because that's going to lead to higher inflation and the ultimate aim of the government is to halve inflation. They claim that this is the best way to uh, fight the cost of living crisis is this figure here. Uh, that is the story of real average weekly earnings in different industries from 2000 to the latest data that we have as of today, that is December 2022. Um, public sector pay is the uh, issue of fiscal policy. It is the topic of, or that's a matter for uh, government's uh, budget. So I'm going to therefore uh, focus on this purple line here, yeah. that is uh, real wages in the sense that it's the earnings of uh, workers in the public sector after uh, corrected for the rising consumer price inflation. And as you can see, until here, the conservative Lib Dem condemn coalition government, there is some modest increase in public sector pie. But I wish to also emphasize that public sector pay, that's the pay in health and education mostly, also pay in uh, civil service. But a lot of these people are doing the work uh, in NHS, they're doing the work in the uh, schools, they're adopt the key workers, clap during the pandemic, working under very risky conditions, uh, have been doing work that has been undervalued for decades to begin with. The top earner sector here is the finance and business services. And you can see that public sector has been undervalued, underpaid. But most importantly, starting with the condemned government's austerity policies, year after year, public sector pay 
failed to keep up with the rise in prices. Hence, real pay of these key workers in health and education and civil service have been decreasing for more than a decade. Uh, and apart from a very brief moment of correction during the uh, pandemic in 2020, here we are again, a fall, continuous fall since then. And as of December, if we compare where public sector pay is compared to 2010, before the condemned coalition, public sector workers are about 5% poorer in terms of their real purchasing power. Now, I'm going to come to the wrong economics in the claim that the government can't afford to increase public sector pay. But apart from this continuous decline, and on top of it, yet more imposed real pay cuts on the public sector workers this year, the government is resisting any concessions, uh, other than some minor concessions currently, because they are trying to signal class warfare against all workers. If they now accept uh, the demands of the striking public sector workers, it is going to give a very strong empowering signal to the rest of the striking workers, and they fear uh, that working class victory in the public sector amidst the biggest strike waves in three decades. Hence, uh, please uh, join the strikes. If you're not in one of the unions who are on strike now, uh, please uh, do visit a picket line. It gives enormous uh, support to workers on the picket lines. Now, um, may I just take a brief moment to really debunk this uh, discourse of the government, which claims the best way to fight the cost of living crisis is to halve inflation. You will hear that repeatedly from uh, the chancellor and the prime minister. There's a very obvious political economy behind this uh, myth, and there is a very clear anti-working class bias in these policies. For one thing, the idea that we can't increase the pay of the nurses, teachers, or civil servants is wrong. Their pay rise would not directly feed into uh, a wage price spiral, as they claim, because a nurse's pay or a teacher's pay is not an input cost for private companies. There's no direct link. There could be indirect links if the government does not increase tax rights to fund for the uh, request uh, of pay by the nurses or teachers or civil servants, but that's a political choice. Indeed, higher pay rights for nurses and teachers and civil servants would lead to higher macroeconomic activity and without even any increase in the tax rights, would fund part of itself. But to be able to fully fund the increase in nurses and teachers and civil servants well-deserved pay rights to cover for the past losses in their real pay, but also really to uh, correct the very undervalued pay in the public sector, uh, we certainly need to increase the tax rights then it's a very simple political economy question. Who should pay for the tax increases such that we value the very socially important work the nurses, the doctors, the teachers, the civil servants are doing? Which tax rights should we increase? And of course, if we do accept the uh, uh, pay demands of the junior doctors, nurses, teachers, civil servants, what would be the signal effect of such a public sector pay rise on the private sector wage negotiations? And thereby, how will it affect the profit margins of the private firms who have been profiteering amidst this uh, deepest crisis of our generation? So in a way, insisting in further real pay cuts in the public sector is a political decision about the government's class position in terms of the distribution of income. It's of course very hypocritic. I don't have to remind you that uh, most of these uh, Tory MPs and government ministers uh, were actually clapping the key workers day in, day out. But as, uh, as, as the public sector workers say, claps don't pay for their 
bills. Um, now, maybe a few more words about the class warfare. The back to work slogan itself, if you look at the dimensions of that in terms of childcare, it's minimalistic. It's totally ignoring the scale of the problem. That how much new investment we need to make in hiring more care workers and paying them a higher decent wage. And of course, uh, even worse, the uh, discourse around back to work when it comes to disabled people is really more sanctions, more bullying, and more intimidation. And of course, this whole obsession with austerity and their unwillingness to tax the rich, in particular to tax wealth of the top 1%, as well as to tax profits and uh, income of the uh, top 1%, will mean that we will see further real cuts, not just in social infrastructure in the uh, form of real pay cuts for nurses, teachers, doctors, but also real cuts to physical investment when it comes to physical capital spending. So how would our budget look like, a people's budget? Well, that should be a radical new paradigm, which I dub as the needs-based approach to fiscal policy. We need a massive amount. One minute left, cheers. Wonderful. Massive amount of new public investment in the green economy, that is renewable energy, energy efficiency, public transport, sustainable organic agriculture, forestry, and the circular economy. We need massive investment needs in what we call the social infrastructure, the purple care economy, that is education, childcare, healthcare, and social care, as well as other infrastructure, in particular green social housing, new hospitals, new schools, new nurseries, and new care homes. We need to use and coordinate all tools of policy from fiscal to monetary to labor market policies and industrial policies. And yes, that means that we will grow the size of the state, the size of the uh, public sector massively by such public investment and therefore decision making in where, when to invest should be embedded in a new form of democratic participatory plan covering these key green purple infrastructure sectors. We can fund this. I say that it will be partly self-financing, but the key is really to get serious about progressive taxation of the top 1% of income and top 1% wealth in particular. We will need to borrow to invest uh, while we manage to reform and enforce our new progressive taxation policies of wealth and income. We need to utilize National Investment Bank embedded in a network of public and cooperative banks. And we need to also make sure that we use the Bank of England where monetary policy fully accommodates this new form of fiscal policy, prioritizing green, purple, public investment. Uh, that means Bank of England should uh, be able to directly lend to the government to fund that. Obviously, uh, maybe half a minute, uh, we need to stop inflation from increasing. The way to do that is not to enforce real pay cuts on the public sector workers. The way to deal with that is price controls, in particular in the energy, rent, and essential food items. Not a socialist country, but France tackled it a lot better than Britain. And we can discuss the details later if you want. But of course, we need to enforce regulations such that we stop the rising profit margins of greed, inflation, uh, fueling uh, firms. We need to ban speculation in commodity markets. That's one of the reasons behind spiraling uh, commodity prices, energy prices, food prices, leading to further price, profit, price spirals. We need to make sure that the working class households don't pay for that. Uh, and one way to think about it is how can we enforce uh, that people are kept in their houses, even if they ca can't cope with the debt payments at the moment. A way to do that is to ban evictions and also ban any disconnections uh, from utilities, as well as forced prepaid uh, meters. And surely the way to tackle cost of living crisis along with these measures 
will go through reversing the squeeze in wages, low incomes and minimum wages, increasing minimum wages to 15 pound an hour, increasing benefits, making sure we rec recover the past losses, increase public sector pie way above inflation because we have to make sure that we value what matters in those key sectors. And of course, in the private sector, the way to tackle that would be to strengthen the trade unions and our collective bargaining institutions, uh, repeal the existing trade union act. And that might be difficult for some small firms. I see that also in the squeeze profit margins at the bottom of the firm distribution. So we need to talk about reactivating fiscal support for short time work to make sure that working people don't pay for uh, bankruptcies at the bottom of the firms. Uh, and we need to make sure we have a full employment policy as we get out of this crisis. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, Oslem. Um, very, very insightful analysis there. And I think with the slides, they're very helpful for people to be able to visualize uh, and get those arguments across, um, you know, in, in a nice, clear way. So thank you for that, Oslem. Um, it's, I'm glad you ended up on getting wages up because our, our next speaker uh, is Fran Heathcote from the P, uh, from the PCS. She's the president of the PCS, and she's going to be giving us a very important update today on the on the industrial action taking place on Wednesday and how we can offer our solidarity. So thank you for joining us, Fran, and over to you. Thanks, Patrick, and thanks everyone for having me along tonight. And can I just start with an apology? We we had a Facebook Live event immediately before this for PCS. And as always happens when you've got somewhere else to go, the IT went down. And so I am slightly late joining. So my apologies. Um, and just on behalf of PCS, I bring you absolute solidarity to this meeting. I think I should probably just start by saying that workers all over the UK are standing up, fighting back and telling this rotten government that enough is enough. We've seen teachers, support staff, university and college lecturers, junior doctors, bus drivers, railway workers, postal workers, firefighters, health workers, alongside now 133,000 civil servants from my union PCS. And that signals a significant escalation of industrial action. It's our biggest dispute in over 20 years over pay, pensions, redundancy and job security and tens of thousands of our members have taken action just since November with a huge show of strength of all members including in the ballot on the 1st of February. We've got more and more areas coming on board every week with our targeted action strategy, members from the Border Force, the DWP, the Department for Transport, Highways England, the Rural Payments Agency, the Land Registry, you name it, they're all taking action and causing significant disruption. But we've been able to take that hard hit in action and plan further disruption thanks to our historic ballot result and we secured the largest mandate that we've ever had for strike action and since then as I say a further 33,000 members have come on board thanks to a re-ballot but PCS members are striking because this government treats its own workers absolutely appallingly I think there's a sort of media perception of civil servants as polar hatted bureaucrats drinking tea sitting around earning a lot of money and not doing much. During the pandemic, a time of national crisis, our members put their own safety at risk and made sure that we could provide the essential services that our public rely on. And the reward for keeping those services running, hard work and dedication, is a relentless attack on our living standards. So let me give you a few statistics. 40,000 of our members are currently using a food bank. 40% of those processing universal credit or other low income benefits are also in receipt of it because their pay is so low. And this month, 46,000 PCS members in just the two biggest departments, the DWP and the HMRC, for the first time will have an enforced pay increase on the 1st of April because for the first time their pay has fallen below the national living wage. And that's a far cry, I think, from the perception that's often painted about civil servants. No real term pay increase now for over a decade. The civil service 2% treasury pay limit, the lowest anywhere in the public sector, all of us overpaying on our pension contributions by approximately £500 a year. So our demands of this government to not just shield our members from the cost of living crisis, but to compensate them for their plummeting living standards. And we're clear that if the government continues to ignore our demands, we're going to escalate our actions still further. There will be no resolution to this dispute until the government addresses 
crisis, the cost of living crisis and how it's impacting. The government is rushing through anti-union legislation through Parliament, representing one of the most brazen attacks on, on trade unions that we've ever seen. Workers who democratically vote to strike could be forced to work and face the sack if they don't. That's class warfare. It's the same workers who the government clapped on a Thursday night that are going to face the prospect of losing their job if they take what is lawful strike action. And undermining trade union, trade union rights even further is going to do nothing to solve the cost of living crisis. So we're sending an emphatic message that the shameful treatment of their own workers cannot continue. But I want to make a point that I hope that every trade unionist and worker will appreciate. And that is that when they tell us that they don't have enough money to pay us a decent wage, tell us that we have to put up with worse terms and conditions and lower pensions because it's all about the economy and what they can afford, let me tell you this, they are lying. Over the past 40 years, ever since Thatcher's government, every government since then has pursued a policy of cuts and privatisation. And we have to accept that in some respect they have been successful because they've managed to make the super wealthy even more wealthy. And they've done that by stealing our assets, our services and our conditions from us. And they won't stop doing that until we stop them. It's those services that provide the basis of something resembling a civilised and stable existence in an inherently unstable system. This government are now determined to take back every one of the gains that have been won over generations. So yes, the current wave of strikes are about living standards, but attacks on our living standards are just one part of the class war that was expanded under Thatcher and has been pursued by every government since. Every government since then has been committed to neoliberalism. At the very centre of that strategy has been cuts and privatisation. Holding down public sector wages is not because there's no money, it's not because the Tories are mean, they may be, but that's irrelevant. It's because they want to demoralise public sector workers, make them feel undervalued and unsupported so that they can drive us out of public services. That includes the National Health Service and the welfare state in order to reduce wages and reduce terms and conditions to the lowest level in those sectors. Underinvestment is one key element and that allows them to claim that services are failing and that the only solution to them is privatisation. And to prepare for privatisation, they cut and they cut and they cut again the valuable services that our members provide to the communities in which they live and work. And then the privatisers swoop in and cherry pick what can be exploited for profit. And that has been the strategy of every government since 1979. The ruling class have used every weapon at their disposal to fight, but to stop us fighting back, anti-union legislation and in increasing ideological offensive to convince everybody that there's really no alternative. So the real point is this, all of these attacks stem from the same source, and that's this rotten government. And if we're going to defeat them, then we have to be united like we've been, never been united before. And that means joint campaigns, joint demands like no cuts, no privatisation, joint activity, and those are two demands that every public sector union should be able to get behind. But more than anything, it means coordinated joint strike action. And if we put the maximum pressure on this government, that's the thing they fear the most, our ability to join up and campaign and coordinate together. February the 1st was fantastic. March the 15th, I'm confident, is going to be huge. So let's send this government a really clear message. Let's st stay united. Let's stand together. Let's campaign together. Let's strike together. And I send you our solidarity to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fran. That was, that was really inspiring. And actually, I just want to echo uh, that same message. Make sure you get down there on Wednesday. Go support uh, the PCS pickets, the NEU pickets, all those other picket lines. If you can make it down to any pickets, just go and support it. Show them that you are with them. Because like we heard earlier on the meeting, this is the, the level of public support for the, the strikes and for the battles that are going on right now are unprecedented. unprecedented and that is for a reason. Um, because of what public service, what are public sector workers and teachers and everyone else is, is up against. Um, we were due to be hearing from John McDonnell, but unfortunately, he's also in that immigration debate waiting to be called. So a very important battle again. Uh, he's promised us a video 
um, which we which he'll record shortly after he's spoken, if he gets called, and we will send that out to everyone who's registered. So please do keep an eye out for that video uh, contribution from John once the meeting has finished. Um, now, as often happens with these things, we've slightly overrun, so we're, we're going to have a round of questions, but if I could ask for just one um, round of questions, and if our speakers could also use it as a sort of closing remark send off and try and keep their contributions to two or three minutes each. Um, so I, I've got four questions here. Please, uh, please only answer one, but just feel free to answer whichever one you want. I think it, it's it's better that we we get you, to, uh, we hear you on, on whatever topic you feel more confident on rather than making sure they all get covered. Um, so we've got a nice general one from Kirsty Lowe and Paisley, who asks, why can't we tax the billionaires and millionaires for the NHS and education? Very simple. I, I, I agree, Kirsty. Why can't we? Um, I've got a question from Mark Hayward, who says, how do we finally knock out the myth that all government borrowing is a bad thing? Uh, so perhaps maybe that's something for, for Oslam. Um, we've got Christy, who's asked, could we make the link between the obscene wealth of the few and the 2.3 trillion national debt, please? Is this socialism for the rich? And then Stephen Burak, I'm going to slightly paraphrase this, uh, asks, the stop the boats policy is surely the cruelest and most dangerous uh, end of the Tory agenda. How do we destroy this evil policy so that more and more people realise that the real problem is selfish greed and the real cul culprits are the Tories and not vulnerable migrants? So we've got four questions there. If I could go in the order we took speakers, so if I could have Sarah first um, for any of, for, to answer any of those four. Is that OK, Sarah? You, you were going to come to me first. Um, <laughs> we absolutely should be taxing the millionaires and the billionaires, as I said in my contribution, you know, the Alistair Salvesons of the world that were one of the richest guys in Scotland um, sent in his chauffeur to take his expensive artwork out of the Dornfresh site when he put it into administration and then put the burden of paying the, that redundancy pay for those 200 workers, low paid workers, many of which had worked there for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, helping give him his wealth. He left them with nothing, no wages, no pay. They had to pl apply for the redundancy payments. He could have paid those redundancy payments out of his wealth and still had enough for himself and multiple generations of his family to come to be more than comfortable. It is greed. They should pay the way. There is absolutely no reason why people need to be billionaires. You know, I'm all for people being wealthy and comfortable and living a good life, but that should be for everybody, not just for those that are um, utilising the system, shall I say. Um, and... You, it, yeah, I think I, I, I'll i leave it at that. Otherwise, I'll go on a rant. But all I would say is I know there's been a few comments about in the chat around um, um, disabled people and those that aren't working. You know, the trade union and labour movement should be inclusive for everyone. We talk about workers because trade union members are generally workers. But when I talk about working together to make things better, then I, I include disabled people, I include migrants and refugees, as well as workers and young people and retired people, because we've all got to come together as the 99% to challenge the 1% that are abusing and exploiting us. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, yeah, so just to echo that, you know, we know that we know here in this meeting that disabled people are at the forefront of the cuts and, and were at the forefront of the cuts since 2010. I'm um, facing very, very difficult times. So, yeah, I really echo that from Sarah. Um, I'm going to go to Donna next. Donna, are you, are you OK to come in on one of those questions? Yes, I can, definitely. Um, I'll do the small boats question, I think, uh, from Stephen. Thanks very much for that question, Stephen. So um, I think I kind of mentioned it a little bit in, in my talk, but it was quite quick, so you might have missed it. Um, but, you know, history has taught us that when we do, um, you know, collectively take actions in lots of different ways, we can challenge the state and we can ch make change. I mean, ideally, if we didn't have, if we could get rid of this government and a government that, you know, is the architect of and, you know, is, is, is bringing about these changes with regards to um, wanting to push back small boats and um, vilify asylum seekers and refugees, that would be a big step forward. 
Um, so, you know, challenging the government in whatever way you can do will really help. But yes, four years of this government, um, um, you know, four years following, you know, Amber Rudd's um, apology about the Windrush scandal um, and the resignation of her as Home Secretary, we've seen the government and successive Prime Ministers and Home Secretaries continue with the hostile environment. Um, we've seen four years of, you know, there was a, a, an abating a period of about a year or a year and a half where they stopped doing the deportation, forced deportation flights. But we see the Home Office have continued with the mass deportation flights, uh, rounding up people who were signing in to um, to the Home Office um, um, who are in this country to 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 um, to fill planes. Um, but what you've also seen is a collective action of anti-racists, of campaigners, of socialists and lots of people, of civil society coming together and listening to calls of action that have taken place where organisations like myself, our, our organisation, Barrack UK, have set up petitions, have done, have spoken on, on radio stations, on um, in newspapers and have raised the call to action to stop those planes from taking place. And many of those people involved in those those campaigns, lawyers that have helped in, in cases where people haven't had legal assistance have managed to get people off of planes, have managed to empty those planes in some sense. And sometimes planes have been cancelled. We've had campaigns also where we've stopped airlines from using, from giving their planes to the to the Home Office to use for deportation. So the Stop Chewy campaign. Chewy is a company that people go on holiday with. Do you know, what I mean? you know embarrassing a company um, by tweeting about it, by protesting outside their shops, actually did make that, that company stop using, utilizing their planes. So coming back to your question about the small boats, the sustained action last time was a, a combination of protests, of campaign campaigners coming onto the streets, public pressure, news coverage, um, you know, action in the House of Lords with our MPs and trade union MPs and stuff and legal challenges as well in the courts. And all that action can stop um, the government from doing what they think they can, can get away with. But it's for all of us to step up and take a part in, in that action in whatever way we can. Um, and so I just urge you all to look at the petition that we've got on the link, but also just get involved in the campaign, find out what happened tonight in the protest, follow the news and, and engage, raise it in your union branches, raise it in your community centres, wherever you are, um, you can campaign about this. If you think about the Windrush scandal, I'll just finish on this. You know, that was um, we noticed back in 2016, um, people starting to be deport, um, deported on, on um, um, planes and stuff. And um, Barrett UK's national chair, Zeta, wrote an article in The Guardian saying, how can 50 Jamaicans be snatched and sent you know, off the streets of Britain and sent to Jamaica. That was two years before the scandal broke in the UK. Mm -hmm. So there's a big momentum of action to stop this from happening that culminated in the scandal breaking, but it meant that people had to agitate with their neighbours about what was happening. It became something you talked about, like you talk about EastEnders or what's going on. Like literally, how can my neighbour who sits next to me, who's down the street, who's he lived here for 50 years, since they were six years old, be deported? People, the general public understand the inhumanity of this. Um, and they, you know, like I said, 82% of people want to help refugees. We just need to, to speak to people's moral compass and, um, and you know, also, as well, make sure that we're also campaigning about the economic questions, which is what we scape people are being scapegoated for. So it's not just about challenging racism. We also need to challenge the system. Yeah. The, the lack of housing, the lack of jobs, the, you know, the, the, the conditions that we're all facing, black and white people in this country, to make sure that we don't allow them to divide and rule us. Thank you for that, Donna. Great um, comprehensive answer to that one. Uh, I'm going to move quickly on to Oslam now. Um, over to you. Yeah, thank you. You're assigning me the borrowing question. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, in business, as well as in fiscal policy of a government, it is totally correct to borrow, to invest. What we need to do is to broaden the narrow concept of investment to include both social infrastructure and physical infrastructure. Social infrastructure is the care economy, that is the wages of the nurses, teachers, uh, doctors, uh, care workers, 
So investing in health, social care, child care and education is investing. Hire more care workers and pay them a higher uh, wage rate. Uh, also invest in the green economy, in energy efficiency, in renewable energy, in public transport and other infrastructure, social housing. And it is uh, feasible to borrow uh, for this because that investment will in the long run pay for itself. Also in the very short run, any government spending creates more national income and thereby increases the tax receipts of the government. However, as the left, we have to be sober and we have to recognize that there is a limit to that nice self-funding capacity, as well as there is a limit to how much a government, particularly a left government, can borrow. And I do have to say I was humbled with what happened to this trust and uh, quasi uh, quartengs budget. Hence, we have to get real and we have to talk about taxing the rich. And that's the other question that I really uh, liked. Uh, Sarah has already talked about it. But yes, we have to tax the millionaires. And I'm going to say, don't go all the way necessarily just to the billionaires. Start with the millionaires. That's where I say tax the top 1%'s wealth, not just income, but wealth. Let me tell you where that starts as a threshold. Who is the top 1% in this country? These are the households with a net wealth that is about 3.4 million pounds. If we tax them at a tax rate of 1% and introduce a little bit more progressivity at a higher wealth threshold, so a progressive wealth taxation targeting the top 1%. Mind you, there are only 206,000 households in this country. So it is easy to monitor and we would need more PCS uh, members, uh, more uh, tax auditors to make sure that we avoid tax avoidance and evasion. But even if they avoid part of that, our estimates show that we can collect up to 130 billion a year by taxing the top 1%. This is about 16% of the total tax revenues in this country. You can invest in a lot of renewable energy, a lot of care economy by doing that. Now, back to the borrowing question. Um, we have to be sober because we need a massive amount of investment in a very short time scale. No government can fund such large scale investment by just borrowing or by just hoping that it will partly self-fund itself. So within the four years of a progressive labor government, we should make sure that policies will be in place uh, from day one to target the wealth of the top 1%, and they are millionaires, not even billionaires. Thank you, Ozzam. Nice to hear those two questions melded, because it really is two sides of the same coin, as it were. Um, and then we're going to finally go over back to Fran. Uh, so Fran, if you want to answer any of those questions in your closing remarks. Yeah, I, w I would like to, and I'd like to really touch on all of them because I think what's been explained by the contributions of just about everybody who's spoken is that we have to articulate not just what we don't want to see but what we do want to see and, and what, what is the alternative. So one of the things that PCS has done over a number of years is produce an alternative to ta on tax justice, an alternative on social security and welfare reform, and most recently, an alternative around the small boats policy. And, and you will know that we had some success in the courts with um, taking the government to court around the small boats policy, and, and we won in court, PCS alongside Care for Calais. But we are also trying to pursue our challenge around Rwanda uh, and the disgusting deportations that the government are trying to push through. And, and I think Gary Lineker has pro proven this week, hasn't he, that actually there is some public sympathy there in a way that perhaps there hasn't always been. And it's our job to articulate an alternative and to make sure that the media don't get away with portraying people, benefit claimants, um, people, you know, um, who are fleeing um, 
terrible conditions in in their own country if the government if the if the right wing media and the government get their way they try to portray those people as the problem and what we've seen just this very weekend around the Gary Lineker stuff is that actually people are starting to see through that and it's our job to make sure they continue to do so but I want to pick up I mean I wasn't in the meeting when you were discussing this necessarily but this issue around disabled workers migrant workers uh, people not in work at the moment for whatever reason because one of the things sent before I was national president I was DWP president for a number of years and one of the things that happens if we're not really careful is that the government is successful in dividing PCS members from benefit claimants because they're saying that you know the, the situation you find yourself in is because it's because of the big bad DWP and that may well be true but the DWP and the staff that work there are those same staff facing the same attacks around low pay uh, not having enough money to live in live on and we have to be really careful not to allow the Tories to divide us. We So one of the things I did a lot when I was DWP president that PCS continues to do is work with claimant organisations, work with disabled people against the cuts, work with Black Triangle and all the other campaign groups to make sure that we are on the same page around defending not just those in work, but those relying on our benefit system because the attacks on them and the attacks on work stem from the same source and that source is this rotten government so I think I'm sorry I missed some of the discussion tonight but this this is the crux of ever many of the issues that we face that if we're not really careful the government is successful in dividing us and we have to recognize that all of the attacks facing both workers and those reliant on on, on benefit of stem from the same source and it's our job to to um, articulate that and to make that very clear this stuff about taxing the rich, absolutely. I mean, as I say, we produced our whole strategy around there is an alternative and tax justice. And, um, you know, the speakers that have already spoken, I absolutely agree with, because clearly, if the HMRC were properly resourced, and they had enough staff in place to actually deal with tax evasion and avoidance, and not just target those people, you know, relatively low income workers that tend to be targeted by the HMRC at the expense some of these super rich people that get away with massive amounts of evasion and avoidance therein lies the issue doesn't it so it all comes down to the same source and that is the government the lack of resourcing into public services and recognizing that all of the attacks are about trying to reduce the state and the public sector and those that provide services that our public rely on and trying to you know trying to give money and give give contracts to their their wealthy friends so i think this has been a really useful discussion but I do think that we need you know collectively all of us on the call need to make sure that we do all we can to make sure the government isn't successful in dividing us in terms of some of these big issues that we face so thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you Fran and you know it's one of the reasons why I love bringing, to, bringing together voices from across our movement as well because we see how much overlap there is between each of these individual issues, you know, so much overlap, overlap there. They're not individual issues. They are all inherently linked. And the way that they are linked is also how we need to fight them as one unified movement fighting on every front. Uh, and it's just been fantastic to listen to all, all of you tonight. Uh, before we sign off, I just want to say a big thanks to everyone who's taken part, uh, our guests as well as our speakers. And thank you for all your questions and comments. I'm sorry that we can get through more questions um you know we want as much audience participation we love hearing from you as well for everyone who takes part our key message from today is that we stand with all of those who are on the march against the tories resisting attacks on the nhs our public services our right to resist and the attacks on our livelihoods as well we stand with you and we're here to offer you platforms to keep taking the fight to the tories and where the La labor front bench maybe won't take to the take the fight to the tories we in the wider labor movement will and we'll put forward the socialist solutions to the economic crisis that we need. So please take on board all the action links that have been posted, including by donating, including by becoming a friend of Arise. Uh, it really helps us to continue putting these important events on. Um, follow our media partner, Labour Outlook. Uh, support our Workers Can't Wait petition and see everything else that's been posted from all the great work that our speakers and our campaigns here today have been doing. So let's continue to build a resistance against the Tories 
popularized socialist economic solutions now that they're needed more than ever. Thank you very much.